subject today, I'll be addressing, are you seeing it there? Yes. Making home a citadel of peace. Yes. COVID-19 or no COVID-19? Making home a citadel of peace. This afternoon, I intend to share with you, to develop on the part that I'm going to be sharing now, the four vital signs of family relational health. I'm going to be touching on that now, but I'll be developing that later. Most of my presentations, as you're told, are coming primarily from my latest two publications, Family Relational Health, a Biblical Psychosocial Priority, and I'll explain that maybe now or in the afternoon, and the second book, Family Relational Health, Songs of Praise, and Bible Verses Paraphrased. In this second book, I've composed 52 new family songs. Why? Because, well, let me tell you, I've been working with the church since 1978. Who is doing some calculation there? And um, as I go around the world as I research in various songbooks, I just find maybe just about 10 songs 10? that address the issue of family. And so I took the challenge over the last eight years to compose these 52 songs. In fact, these two books. And the song we sang this morning, unfortunately, we didn't have it as big on the screen, but you sang it, Designed at Creation. We sang the first three stanzas, and I'm going to just take you right now to the fourth and fifth stanzas, which we never sang. No problem. Maybe it's time for us to sing it together. I perceive that we're going to sing it a cappella. No problem. You know the tune already. So the fourth stanza goes, in fact, maybe I should read it to your attention. Societal gender battle attempts another blow. Philosophical prattle would stop Families grow. But Christ said in him we are one. None without other be. And victory will be all one. As every eye shall see. So the tune, as you know it is. Societal gender battle attempts another blow. Philosophical prattle would stop families grow. But Christ said in him where one, none without other be. And victory will be all one, as every eye shall see. And then the final stanza. Then in the morrow glorious, the pair original, the family now victorious, Bible foundational, will in eternal sunshine bask bold with confidence as God's creation design stand as his providence. Now, the subject is, again, family relational health, or rather making home a citadel of peace. Why are we doing these presentations? Why do we do presentations on family? Well, we normally say family life. But I'll bring to your attention why I've renamed it Family Relational Health. Why these presentations? Number one, there are six. To present God's original ideals for the family. God's original ideals. Now, beloved, I heard your sister, original. And, you know, the original is always the best. Why do I strike this note so intensely, God's original ideal? Because the family is under attack. Yeah. I'll come back to that. Now, what is God's original ideal for the establishment of a family? Well, Lord help me. 
I'm going to get in trouble, but I'm going to do it. So what is God's original ideal for establishing a biological family? Here is what you already know. God's original ideal is this. One mature adult male plus one mature adult female. That still is God's original, original idea. idea. Another reason Another we do reason these presentations is to impart knowledge. Because God bemoans the state of his people, recording us here, chapter 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And over these 40 years of practicing family, relational health, and counseling, and therapy around the world, one thing I've seen for sure is that many families have been destroyed. Let me begin with that. I've seen marriages destroyed in my therapy practice around the world, in my private practice, in my offices. Marriage destroyed. Parents and children relationship destroyed. Relationship at the workplace destroyed. Human relationship. Reason? Lack of knowledge. Wait. The knowledge I'm alluding to is not talking about the knowledge that I have acquired over the years of studying. I'm talking about simply how to relate with each other. But it's more than just loving each other. As we go on, I'll show you. Another reason we're doing these presentations is to impact and change behavior. As a therapist, when a client sits before me in my counseling room. My intent is that when he or she or they leave, they should leave better than they came in. The same applies to this treatment center called church. This is not a place, in fact, let me say this way, Whenever I finish a presentation in person, say, oh, Dr. Gordon, I enjoyed the presentation. I said, Lord, maybe I didn't get it across right. Because if it's all you do, enjoy, it was a nice presentation, then I would have failed. The intent is to impact the mind so that behavior is changed for the better. That's the reason we are here today. Not just to enjoy church. Oh, by the way, let's not be fooled. We ought to enjoy the fellowship. But part of that enjoyment is growth. Another reason for, the chain, for these presentations is to enrich relationships. Now, I don't know who I'm speaking with. I do not know. I always say it this way, you know. I know I speak to a congregation but it is one person who is listening to me right now. And that one person is you. Are you there? Are you there? So it's only you I'm talking with. Okay. So, another reason for the presentation is to improve what church? Our quality of life. And ultimately, I said ultimately, is to prepare us for the soon coming of Christ. Let me make sure that is clear. Anything that happens in the church, any program, any presentation, if at the end of it, we are not better prepared for the coming of Christ, scrap the program. Don't bother do it. Whether it is a social, 
whether it is a walk, a trip, a fasting, a sermon, at the end of it, we should be better prepared for the coming of Christ. So, you know, sometimes persons hear, oh, he's coming to do a family life presentation. All he's going to talk about is family. In fact, I'll share this with you quickly. I remember one year, many years ago, 10, 20, 30 years ago, I was one of my tent evangelistic crusade I was conducting. And as I went there and, you know, met with the planners, one elder bemoaned in the planning meeting and said, so, elder... Are you telling me that for the entire four weeks of this crusade, all you're talking about is family? And he went on, he said, that means we're not going to baptize anybody? <laughs> well, at the end of it, 122 persons were baptized. And about 80 couples went through a marriage recommitment ceremony. We had a special ceremony for singles. We had for youths. We had for that. The point is, and the 28 fundamental beliefs were taught. But for the 35 presentations I made under that tent, every one of them was family-oriented. You see, the truth is that the gospel... Hmm, thank you, Lord. The gospel, when the Lord announced what we call the Proto-Evangelium, which is the first preaching of the gospel, where it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. You know the text. Amen. Let me remind you. When God made that announcement, he made it in response to a broken relationship. It was relationship that was broken. First of all, the relationship between heaven and earth was broken. Proof. Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? Don't you normally come when I come? I can't come. Because I'm naked. Relationship broken. And then, when he asked, come on, talk to me, Adam. How do you account for this? What happened? He said, well, it's really not my fault. It, technically, Lord, it's your fault. Because the woman you gave me that led me to this. And so relationship was damaged. But thanks God for grace. Amen. And I'm trying to set the background, sister, brother. You spoke. You understand me now. Thank the Lord. Because it's important you connect with me. Did I say connect? Watch. Coming back. So, beloved, here is what is driving my work. That is, the family is under attack. And the only sound response is for us to fight back. Did you hear me? Fight back. And my wife will remind me every time, we do not fight back at each other. We fight back at the forces that are hell-bent on destroying our families. But we cannot fight back against these forces except we are armed with knowledge and skill. So church, let me level with you. Let me make sure I know right now, you naturally, you're still sizing me up. That's understood. That's part of relationship. You're trying to... You know, trying to work, connect with him. Let me say something to you here. I am not a paid mourner. You know who a paid mourner is? In some cases, I'm told, you know, when funerals were going to be held and persons didn't have anybody to cry, they would pay somebody to cry. 
you know, because it is expected at a funeral, you need to hear, ah, ah. and just in case family members don't feel safe to cry, they pay somebody to cry. Well, I'm not here as a paid mourner. I'm here doing this, sharing this with you, because over these 40 years, God has blessed me, I repeat that, as the background. I have seen families destroyed. I have had to turn my car into emergency vehicle, no exaggeration. By emergency vehicle, I mean 12 o'clock in the night, 11 o'clock. Elder, can you come? We're having a problem. And because I'm the director of family ministries, I'm counseling director, I take it and then say, Lord, here I go. Through stoplight, through stop sign, up, down, emergency. My brothers and sisters, I respect you enough to tell you only the truth. That is what drives me. So, you know, sometimes persons will say, hey, 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 why are you sounding so serious? Somebody said this, I read this. If you can keep your cool, maybe you, know, you don't know what is happening around here. So maybe if you think I'm sounding, it's because of what I deal with. And as I stand here, I'm not taking any risk. I don't know who is there. I don't know who needs what now. So I'm going to just deliver it as I honestly believe it. Amen. One. Number two. Let me assure you. Dolores and I eat from the same pot out of which I'm now serving you. Amen. Do you understand that? Amen. I don't mean to in insult your intelligence when I ask if you understand that. I just want to connect with you. In other words... In coming here and after we leave we're going to play over this sermon again we too and we're going to challenge each other we got to live up to that I just thought I'd be human enough because I hate to be felt and say you sit down there and I'm up here talking to you Please. So, the family is under attack. Yes? yes? That's what I know. Let me bring out something to you. Let me run fast through the text. Uh, I call this one of my anchor texts. You know the text well. Come on, I would like to invite you to read it with me. Go. For we wrestle not. Let me try it again. I want to hear the congregation, you know. Let's do it together. Go. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness. Now, when the church is setting up an evangelistic move elder, and we cite this text, we expect the members to be fired and go. Now... I have paraphrased that same text in the context of family relational health. And this paraphrase that I'm going to share with you is in the book, one of my books. Now, here's the paraphrase. I'll read it to you hearing as you follow. For we wrestle not against ordinary marital, parental, and general family relational challenges, but against the continuous deteriorating standards of this world. Are you still there? We are wrestling against the subtle forces set at destroying God's original family ideals. We are wrestling against the corrupt immoral practices of this age operating from high academic, high religious, high social, 
and other influential stages of the society. This alone by itself is a sermon. Let me just summarize it because I don't want you to miss it. The forces of hell that are hell bent at destroying God's original family ideal, they're not coming from ordinary sources. They're coming from high academic, you know what that means? From the universities, where the professors have A to Z behind their names. And when they come out and make a proclamation such as, well, you know, ladies and gentlemen, any two people can form a relationship. And as long as any two people love each other, that's fine. Yes? And they expect the Bible-believing church people to buy that. I know that even my standing up here and speaking like this could potentially put me under surveillance. I'm aware. But such has got to be those who decide to proclaim God's word. So let me push a little further. Let me switch there and bring your attention to another word in our subject, and that is health. Here's a text that the church uses often when we're having health fairs and, you know, all of these health events. Correct. The text is 3 John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayst prosper and be in health even. By the way, I should let you know, the words you see me emphasize, they mean more than just what they look like. Beloved, which means the l members of the church. By the way, are you beloved? Is that the way you feel? Okay, fine. The apostle says, I want to prosper and be in health. And the word even there means to the same extent or the same way. Wait now, there is an assumption in that word. The assumption is that by virtue of being a member of the household of faith, you are supposed to be prospering spiritually. Yeah. Wait, spiritually means in a healthy relationship with God and in a healthy relationship with your fellow man. Hello, that's another presentation. So let me ask you two questions about health. When someone asks you, how is your health? How is your health? I heard you. She said, which one? <laughs> Normally, especially for those of us seniors, when that question is asked, how is your health? The normal, natural state of mind is, well, last time I went to the doctor, and he, she checked me, you know, said, well, my pressure is a little up, I feel a little joint pain here, uh, in my body. How is your health? But suppose I should put this on the screen. Next question. How is your family relational health. Hold a minute now. What's that? Family relational health? Explain that to me. I will seek to do that in quick time. Let's take another text. David was speaking on the inspiration, Psalm 139. Come on, I, I trust that all of us can join this. I, come on now, this is not belonging to David. Speak for yourself. I will praise thee. Why? For I am Sonny Lee Gordon. Wait. Can you put your name in there? 
I, Anthony Lee Gordon, will praise you. Why? Because I know that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Is there somebody who can testify to say, yeah? Amen. Praise the Lord. But he went beyond that. He said, marvelous are thy works. Yeah. And that my soul knoweth right well. That's the old King James. What was David saying here? In the first part, I will praise thee because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. David was alluding to the state of his B-O-D-Y. The marvel of his body. But he went on in inspiration and said, Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right. He was talking about the state of his mind. You see, the composite human being. What did I say, church? Wait a minute now. Let me bring in something here. Let the teacher trip in. It is understood, and I share this everywhere I go, if you follow any of my presentations in line. Research says, my dear sister, when you sit your presentation, only 30% of what the presenter says you're going to remember. Only 30%. You cannot remember the 100. So every now and then, I seek to punch a line so they can help you and you can say, okay, I'm going to put this in my 30%. Because the thing I don't want to happen is for you to leave here today and say, what did the preacher say again? Oh, he said something about health. Really? Come on. Let me hope I can get you to do better than that. So David was talking about is composite B-E-I-N-G, which is a combination of body and mind. Okay. Now, let's talk quickly. When we talk about health in society in general, we tend to focus primarily, sometimes exclusively, on this, our physiological health, which means the state and function of the body. Am I coming clear? Yeah. That is to say, how we feel physically, anatomically, which means the various parts of the body. Are you with me still? Am I coming clear, church? Yeah. How we feel hormonally, the various hormones and chemicals. How we feel neurologically. For example, the cramps that I have sometimes in my feet may be a sign of peripheral neuropathy because I'm getting matured. I didn't say old. <laughs> Are you there with me? So when we talk about health, we tend to limit it to the state and function of the body. OK, let me say this to you. When you go to see your medical doctor, when you go to the clinic or the hospital, you go to triage, right? And the nurse checks your vital signs. And here are they quickly. Vital sign number one, talk to me. Good, I am, I'm beginning to feel you now. Next, our respiratory rate, especially in COVID time, true. Right. Next vital sign, heartbeat or pulse. And the next vital sign, watch me now. And when the nurse checks that and writes it down and goes into the medical doctor. Sometimes when you go in to see the doctor, before he even touch you or anything, he looks at the reading and says, hmm, are you hypertensive? Are you suffering from so-and-so? Are you? How did he know that? Because your vital signs gave him an indication as to how your body is functioning. Are you still there? Yes. Okay. Now, I am not a medical doctor. I'm a psychologist. I'm a family relational health therapist. Over these years of my practice, I have developed, as God inspired me, four vital signs to indicate 
how healthy your relationship is. Are you ready for them? Yeah. Pack these into your 30%. Ready? Before I do that, let me remind you of something. That not only is, are we focusing on our physiological health, but we must focus on our psychological health. On yeah. our what? Now, I know that in uh, society, you know, the words psychological tend to have a little fearful sound because people use it sometimes to curse each other. You see you? You're psycho. Have you ever? Well, maybe some of you don't know the culture. You know. Am I connecting? You're psycho, which means they're implying that you're sick in your head. You're crazy. Well, I have news for you. All of us are psycho. Is anybody going to leave now? <laughs> All of us are psycho because the functioning of our mind is the psychological aspect of our being which God made. Yes. Oh, yes. Hello, church? Yes. So, our psychological health talks about the state and function of the mind spiritually. Yes. Spiritually? Yes, watch me. Your spirituality exists in your mind. So when the Bible says, you shall hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, come on church, talk to me, you know it. Walk in it, turn not to the right, turn not to the left. What's that? It's the Holy Spirit who is communicating with you through your brain cells. Yes. Oh, yes. 35 billion brain cells. Average. And it's the Holy Spirit who is communicating to you. So by the way, as Christians, you don't talk about, you know, my mind tell me. Oh, no, no, no. If you're in touch with the Lord, then the Holy Spirit speaks to you. So, our mind spiritually, mentally, socially, I don't have the time to extrapolate on all of them, emotionally, but this is the one, the missing one that we hardly talk about, and that is, help me church, Say that again, please. Good. Relationally. That is to say, here, I'm going to come down a little. Let's talk about that. So I'm going to give you the four vital signs. Four vital signs that help you to know the state of the relationships that are in your mind. Vital sign number one is called, come on, talk to me, church. Connection. Say it out. Connection. connection. What's that? You, you remember the number of times you said connection? I said connection, because I know where it's coming from. Yeah. You see, brother, when we met on the telephone last night, we began connecting. And when, we, when you picked us up today, this morning, we connected. And I'm satisfied, I believe, under God, we will stay connected and we look forward to being in the kingdom together. The truth be told, even right now, all of you there, some might be a little distracted, some might be looking at their phone, and some might be saying, oh, trying to, you're still trying to connect with me. Is he making sense? It's connecting you're doing. Well, my, fellow, my dear technicians, we had a connection. Yes, gentlemen in the technical room, we had a connection. So the first person I interacted with today from this church is you, Elder. And the second, well, Sister Clark, Sister Clark, you're here, yeah? And then the technicians. I'm going to develop on that some more. 
So the first vital sign of relationship is what? Good. The second one is, I hear you. What is it? Rapport. What's that? It means this simply. When I speak with, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to create this now as a lab. Yes, sir. When you speak with or to her, and vice versa, what happens when what he says to you enters here and goes in here? How does that impact you? Do you share so that at the end of the day, you too can be benefited from what transpired as you? Or is it one way? That is to say, well, let me tell you something. Just, you understand what I'm saying? And I do. I'm finished. You have anything to say? <laughs> what happens? That's a vital sign that will tell how healthy the relationship is or not. Yeah. Am I coming clear? Oh, yeah. Let's take vital sign number three. And that is, what's that? Oh. Say it out, church. Oh. What's that? It's talking about Let me tell you what it's talking about. It's talking about something that some of us don't like. Simply, emotion, feeling. And some of us, I'm going to close my eyes and say it, Lord, let's get in trouble. Some of us, males. Some of us, men. Our society teaches us to be tough. And you know, I don't deal with this emotion thing, you know. I'm not emotional. You're too emotional. My brother, my sister, that's an insult to God. Yeah. Why is it so? Because your emotion was part of God's gift to you. The unfortunate thing is this. Sin is a mental disease. Sin is a what? It affects the mind. And as a result of that, some of us, some of us have been so-called toughened. Bad experiences. And we no longer feel. So you can go and talk. Sorry about that. Some of you don't understand the vernacular. You can go on talking. It doesn't mean a thing to me. And I have seen relationships die because the bond becomes weak. The bond becomes crystallized. And finally, the bond breaks. I have seen those happen in my professional practice. That's why I speak the way I do, because I don't know who's listening to me now. Let me tell you the fourth vital sign. What's that, church? Oh, you're there. I can feel you now. What is it? You know what that means? Oh, no, no, no. Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean this. Here, take it. You can't say I don't support you. <laughs> you have everything that you're asking for. See that? I support you. That's not what I'm talking about. The support I'm talking about, my brothers and sisters, is, in, is simply being there. Yeah. Woo! You didn't get it. Yeah. Being there when I need you. 
even if you're a thousand miles away. Thank God for cell phone. Are you still there? I can't resist this, Lord. This is all you're giving me. I'm going to say to them. Even at 1,100 o'clock in the night, when you're in your deepest REM, the deepest sleep, and you're a thousand miles away, and your phone rings, and when you take it up, you saw that it is call his or her name in your head now. By the way, if you're married, it should be your wife's name you're calling. <laughs> if you're married, it should be your husband's name you're calling. If you're he's seated here. Call the name of somebody significant in your mind now. Are you ready? Yeah. We're going to do an exercise. So, at this weird hour, your phone rang, and it wake you out of sleep. And when you look in the face, you saw his name, her name. You have one of two possible responses. I'm going to play them for you. Are you ready? Uh, why are you calling me at this hour? Oh, you know I'm asleep. What do you want now? Or, uh, I'll, I'll call her name. Del, are you okay? I'm deep in sleep, but what happened? Are you okay? Ask your question. Which of the two suggest being there? The first or the second? Do your introspection now. What is the truth in your heart? When you say, I'm asleep, are you okay? Are you there for me? You know what happened to the person immediately? He or she feels supported. Why? Because you're there. And then here she says, and sometimes at the end of it, the person says, all right, going back to sleep. I'm so glad you answered. Thank you. Why is this so? Because all relationships, all human relationships, begin and continue to exist where? In the mind. This evening, God willing, I'm going to develop on this some more for you. But I want to move on to this key point as I seek to bring this home. Making home a citadel of peace. Peace? Here's one of the texts that was read. If any man teaches otherwise and consent not to wholesome, even to words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to doc the doctrine which is according to godliness. Are you seeing it on screen? Read with me, please. He is knowing, but dotting about question and strives of word. Weir of comet, envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men of what church? And destitute of the truth. Watch this. Supposing, that means thinking, that gain is godliness from such persons because Come on, read. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I ask you a question. Which of those is characteristic in your relationship? Contentment, and there's another word I'm going to balance now, contempt. 
Okay, let's read Job 31, 34. Did I fear a great multitude? Or did the, talk to me church, the contempt of families terrify me? Church, listen to me please. There are families, no wait, hold it Lord, let me, let me go here. We are objects of contempt to our neighbors, of scorn and derision to those around us. While that was making reference prophetically to Jesus, let me bring it home to families. Now, I'm going to say something very sensitive, but I cannot help but say it. There are too many cases where some family members are so intensely hurt by those who live behind closed doors with them that they fear showing their face to others. Did that come clear? Yes. The neighbors, the neighbors know that when you come out there and smiling and going on, help me Lord, they know what is happening behind closed door. And you are simply just hiding behind a smile. What is he trying to put on? We already know. I know this is potentially sensitive. But that's the work I do. And I'm not talking about marriages only. I'm talking about families. Have the various categories. So let me push on. Family contentment versus family contempt. So, making home a citadel of peace. What is a citadel? Let's, do a little, let's go into the classroom now. A citadel is a fortress. Are you there? It is a stronghold. It is a bastion, a refuge, a sanctuary. Home. Home. Your home from which you came to here. From which you'll be leaving here to go back. Ought to be a fortress, an anchorage, a place of respite, a haven. Oh, Lord. A refuge, a place of affirmation. Let me fast forward, because I know my time is going badly now. I'm going to share with you a poem, a, a memory gem. Now, you youngsters in school, you don't, I don't think you know the term memory gem. <laughs> uh, we hold the ones from the old days. I just cooled down the engine a little. I learned this gem. Young lady, I, Anthony Gordon, learned this gem when I was about in third class. Not the same as grade three. It's a long time. When I was maybe about, let's call it 12 years old. I know you're doing some calculation down there. Anyway, we'll get back to that. But I remember being taught this gem. I did not know that God was equipping me decades later to share it with you. Let me walk you through it now. Help me, Lord. When I speak of home, <laughs> I speak of the place where those I love are gathered together. And even if that place was a gypsy's tent or a barn, Call it by the same good name, notwithstanding question. And this is, this is intended to be introspective. Can you speak this way about the place from which you came this morning? Can you speak this way about the place you're going back to? That is to say, man, when I go home, <sighs> Does that mean we never disagree? Of course we disagree. Can I, can I pinch you? 
and tell a little story. Dale and I, after 47 years of marriage, we still disagree. Who is disappointed now? So let me tell you my way I say it. Our teeth and tongue still meet, not only for kissing. See, we got real. Are you there? Oh, yeah. But the truth is, breeze can't blow between the two of us. I speak like this. I do not want to come over to you as an academician, always oh, psychologist, and forget that. Let's talk about real people who I seek to be. Okay, let me run on then. I know you're being patient with me. I'm going to cut some things out. I want to share something with you about familiarity, and because familiarity can breed. Contempt. Do you know what that means? It means, oh, let me run on. Oh, dear Lord. I'm going to come back to that. Watch this. 87% of the relationships, or 87% of our lives, is influenced by the relationships that we are engaged in. Wait. Oh, we're not in any relationship. Let me share something with you. From the mere fact you said it that way, it's an indication that you are. But the relationship is not healthy. That's why you say it that way. We're not in really, I'm in no relationship with him. You're hurting so badly with the relation that's already here. And you're trying to ward it off, but it doesn't get out like that. 87%. Check yourself. How many of these relationships are you in? See them there? Marital relationship. Parental relationship. Sibling relationship. Sororal, which means sister to sister. Fraternal, brother to brother. Social relationship. Business relationship. Collegial relationship. Of all these relationships that every single one of us are in, how are they impacting, affecting you? Oh, no, no, don't, don't run from that. Home sweet home. Any of you older ones know that? that? Yes. Remember those days? Yeah. Home sweet home. Oh man, when the light goes, oh, suddenly your lady is smiling. You know it? Have you ever seen? You do? Your grandma's, oh, good, good, good. You know, when, uh, when we lit that lamp and, uh, you know, it shines on the wall, home sweet home. It should not only be shining on the wall, it should be shining through our minds. Yes. But brothers and sisters, unfortunately, if sin has affected us so badly. Some of, us have, some of us in our homes have to keep our distance. I'm just running these fast. I'm not going to go through everything. Put it on the screen and just make a quick comment and move. Some of us in our homes, we have to keep distance. Especially since COVID. Oh, by the way, let me tell you something. Some of us want to blame COVID. Well, in medical field, there's what is called predisposed illness. So, you know, COVID said we had to keep a distance. Truth be told, you are already distant in your mind. And you're just capitalizing on COVID now. My brothers and sisters, I am not for one split second going contrary to what the medical uh, teaching is keeping a distance, but physical distance should not be the same as emotional distance. By the way, this afternoon in my presentation, I'll provide for questions and answers, for feedback with me. The crisis in relations, let me run some of the things to you. As a result of COVID-19, here are some of the things that I've had to be treating. 
insomnia, digestive problems, psychosomatic illness. By the way, quick, quick. What's that? You see, when the mind is not healthy, it affects the body. Because the mind is the engine that drives our being. When you turn on the mind, if it's not clicking right, if it's not accelerating right, the body will go limp. <laughs> Tell him it, Lord, you sure? Yes. 19, in the 70s, I was living at a certain place when I was teaching. And this particular morning, the landlord got his bicycle and was riding out. And he bade me, go, bye, teacher. Have a nice day. Good. Ten minutes later, I saw the gentleman come back. And he said, oh, Lord, I didn't remember to check my horoscope. <laughs> Wait. Wait. So he went to his room and checked his horoscope. Do you remember when he was leaving the first time? Bye, teacher. When he was leaving the second time, watch me. Oh, God, I'm going to have a bad day. <laughs> Why? Because my horoscope said so. <laughs> the mind. The mind is the engine that drives your being. And one thing that influences your mind is the state of the relationships that are in there. Too many times people get ill, can't digest, can't sleep, can't everything. And you go to the medical doctor, and he said, well, I have to run a, a series of tests. All the oscopies, and the ologies, and the... <sighs> and when all the tests come back, good news, they are negative. But the person, but doctor, I'm still feeling. And if the doctor is competent and professional, he will say to you, all right, normally I would just spend, you know, 15 or something. Like, Sit down, let me talk with you a little. Tell me something. Are you married? Do you have children? Where do you work? Do you have friends? And by the time he runs one or two of those questions, doctor, stop right there. Don't ask me anything about that. The moment you call that, I just feel the pain again. Do you know why? Because the relationship in your mind was so severely bad. And that's what we call psychosomatic illness. In simple terms, the power of the mind over the body. Let me wind down, Lord. I'll come back this evening. I'll share some, of, some more with you. Uh, look at that scene. Sometimes, you know, husband, have wife or husband have to feel so scared. It's as though they want to say, keep your distance. Don't come here. Children. Cousins, uncles, aunts, keep a distance. Wait. God forbid that that should be in the church. Because sometimes, even in this place, some members feel that they need to keep their distance. Because that one is so holy. Lord, help me here. And sometimes new members feel scared, can't go so close to that holy one. <laughs> Church, I'm sorry. I must let you know. Remember, I was baptized on the 16th of April, 1972. So I, I think I have a few little years of experience. So when I speak like this, I'm speaking from what I know. Wind down, Lord. Yes, thank you. So, Ouch. Relational conflicts, family conflicts, workplace conflict. I will say I'm going to cut all of that out. 
I'll come back to it. The citadel of peace. Lord, how do I, this is you speaking, how do I make peace reign in my heart amidst the turmoil around me? Because at the end of the day, Anthony Gordon cannot blame Dolores for not having the peace he ought to have. True? By the way, every time I call my name, you put your name there. We need knowledge of God. True? And this is obtained through sustained private personal prayer. Let me, why I'm appealing now. Question, how is your personal private prayer life. I am not talking about the roast of prayer. You know? Well, it's time to pray. Lord, have mercy and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. I let the words of her mouth in the meditation of her heart. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those moments when you are alone with God and you connect with him and you feel that the Holy Spirit lifts you into his very presence so you can come back down to earth and say thank you God yeah. all right next you need knowledge about yourself you know sometimes some of our relationships are so bad because you have lost connection with your own self what is your temperament well you know I'm an ignorant person you know <laughs> I don't want anybody spark around me What's in that for you to cherish? That's a weakness of character. Know yourself. Know your background. Know your strengths. Know your areas of growth. All right. All right. Let's go to the final one. Let's sing. The closing song. Another of the compositions. You'll meet the book this afternoon. It is sung to the tune of A Shelter in the Time of Storm. And I compose it to reflect the same citadel of peace. Da, 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 a shelter in the time of storm. You know the tune, don't you? Wonderful. So we're going to sing our closing song. We're going to suspend the standing order. Remain seated for a while and sing. And then I'll indicate to you when we stand, OK? okay. Let's go. Sing. The family. Bond, a stronghold true, a citadel of peace for all, a place secure and love pursue, a citadel of peace for all. Secure bond in and courage of hope, Christ in us, and we live in Christ, breaking all. Praise the Lord. Sing the second stanza. Go. Oh, home, sweet home, wherever it be, a palace or a humble tent, or hearts unite, or love flows free, relation, help is all in us now. Seek your bonding and courage. And over, I just felt impressed to offer personal prayer. As I said, I look over this congregation, I do not know who is listening to me. I don't know who is going back home with what. 
I know that in this congregation there are healthy families. You know why I know that? Because God says he will never leave his people without a witness. So there must be healthy families. I did not say perfect. Healthy. There's something else I know. That if this be a typical congregation, which it is, there is no doubt there could be hurting families here. Because the mystery of iniquity remains. But that's why we're in this church today. Because this place is supposed to be a hospital for sinners. And I don't know how many of you might have gotten healed if you did. But the word is, this place is a hospital for sinners. And when you get healed, you do not get discharged. You join the staff. Which means that if for any reason something happened good for you today, and this is not a cheap promotion, I'm sincere about it, call someone and tell them to come and join you in the hospital this afternoon. Not because any genius is here, but God will use me and you together to see how much we can strengthen those four bonds, those four vital signs. I'm going to offer a prayer for you. I just feel impressed. So, whatever be your own situation, bond your heart with me now. Join me in prayer. Lord, I did the best I could. But my best does not match anything close to your supreme. I spoke, Lord, out of my heart. My brother, my sister, your son, your daughter sat here patiently. God, you alone know what happened in his, her heart. I have no doubt, Lord, some are strengthened. But you know, Lord, if there's a hurting family member here, husband, wife, father, brother, sister, cousin, aunt, uncle, in-law, step, wherever, if he or she is here, and as a result of this presentation today, Lord God, just in case, Lord, any wound was opened up, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll pour oil in it, close it back, and grant him her healing. Lord, strengthen us. And may we leave this place today better than we came. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. So before the closing prayer, I'm going to invite you to stand. I'm going to sing the second stanza again in the chorus, and the benediction will be pronounced. Singing. Two. Oh, home, sweet home, wherever it be, a palace or a humble tent, our hearts unite, our love goes free, relation, health is all in.